Welcome to today's webinar. Yeah. Uh, welcome all of you to today's webinar session. Um, today we are kickstarting our second series on donor readiness. Uh, so for people who are uh, new to Satwa's knowledge sessions, uh, Satwa has been conducting uh, fortnightly webinar sessions on various topics. And for the last two to three months, uh, we have been anchoring our sessions around fundraising and uh, the series that we have been calling Fundraising 101. Um, and what we realized is while we talk so much about fundraising, it's also important to ensure that we are internally prepared as an organization, as a team, uh, and ready for donors, especially with uh, so much changes in the compliance requirements and uh, the donor asks. So uh, hence, we are kickstarting the series on donor readiness. And uh, I mean, today's session is the first one uh, among the series. And you'll also see very interesting sessions that are coming in the future. Uh, so in today's session, uh, we talk about donor due diligence and how do we prepare ourselves for donor due diligence. Uh, we understand this is a very broad topic and there is a time constraint that we are working with, right? We have two hours of time. So today's agenda will cover the following, and Ashwini, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so we will start with an overview of organizational due diligence, right? What, what are the donor expectations? What do donors look at uh, uh, in the organizations for donor due diligence? What are the different elements that uh, uh, you have to focus on and so on? Once that is done, we would want to do a little bit in-depth, uh, we want to go a little bit in-depth into financial due diligence alone. Uh, the reason being that I think that is one area where we have, we usually get the most number of questions uh, in terms of how do we present this to uh, donors, what do donors expect, what do we need to have with us, how do we prepare ourselves because it's also a lot of documentation and stuff. So we want to make sure that we use this uh, uh, 120 minutes that we have today uh, very judiciously. So after the overview, we'll completely focus on financial due diligence aspect. Uh, and what we will do in the rest of the sessions is also talk about and take up some of the other elements of due diligence which we are not covering today. Uh, and with us today, we have two people who will be uh, helping us with the session. Um, so first we have Akshay Modi from uh, Sattva CSRT. Uh, so he's a senior member in uh, Sattva CSR team and is, has done, I'm sure, a lot of due diligence. So uh, Akshay will take up the first part of the session where he'll take you all through the uh, due diligence overview. Uh, we also have Parth Joshi, who is the founder of Arvaksha Consulting, and uh, he will take us through the details of the financial due diligence part. Um, he comes with an expertise in finance, operations, compliance, policies, and documentation, and uh, I would say the right person to kind of take us through the session. Uh, and as I always say, as you uh, listen into uh, both of them, please feel free to uh, share any questions that you have on the chat. Uh, we have dedicated 30 minutes towards the end of the session only for Q&A, but uh, if there are any questions that come your way, please feel free to share over the chat and we'll kind of take it up uh, towards the end. I hope uh, you find the session uh, useful. So I'm just uh, uh, passing it on to Akshay to uh, start the session. Akshay, over to you. Hi, thanks uh, a lot, Tom. You know, good evening, everyone. Uh, very, very happy to get to interact with all of us and maybe potentially try to share a little bit of the understanding that we have gotten with respect to organizational due diligence by way of some of the work that we tend to do uh, at Sattva with a lot of our corporate uh, clients. Now, what we have basically been kind of saying is that with this entire, I think, focus around due diligence we just wanted to, you know, maybe start this session off by getting a quick feeler from all of us. Maybe if one or two of us might, we'll just want to unmute ourselves and maybe talk about it or maybe share some thoughts on, on chat as well. Just why do you even think a due diligence is required, right? I think maybe if we can just start with that basic, right? I'm, I'm sure all of us as part of, say, different civil society organizations, NGOs, may have engaged with a lot of donors, philanthropists, CSRs, etc., and undergone a due diligence process but i mean at the heart of it 
why do we even think a daily process is ne even needed? Can we maybe just get some thoughts going just to see what exactly are some of the perspectives that we all have about due diligence a little bit broadly, a bit in general? What do we think about it? Why is due diligence even needed? How do we even think about due diligence? Please feel free to share on, on chat. Feel free to unmute, share a couple of thoughts, comments. Transparency, accountability. Ensuring legitimacy of the organization. Fair enough. The benefits are reaching out to those who really need it. Okay. Interesting. Making organization feel where the money is going. We'll just go a little deeper onto this. Organization outreach, fair enough. Well, I think we have we have a broad sense of of responses, right? And I think all of us are speaking in a way that's in the in the same language, right? Whether the organization is capable to utilize the funds, absolutely fair. Right? Uh, the way I mean, I think about this personally as well, right? I think for me, the answer lies in a in one word, right? Which is along the lines of all these areas, right? Transparency. Uh, capability to to you know utilize funds etc. In a way, when we are starting with a when we are starting with a relationship, when we are starting with say some kind of an engagement with between a donor organization and a and a fund receiving organization or a non profit, I think the due diligence is really helping to serve a very critical purpose of bridging a trust. Uh, you know, uh, bridging for the lack of trust at the startup. That an organization, if I have to possibly engage with a nonprofit, uh, I need to possibly trust uh, the NGO. And that is possibly something that we see in possibly any and most walks of our life, right? That for any kind of an engagement, any kind of relationship, any kind of dealing that you might have with an individual or with a group or with an organization, we would like to first want to build a reasonable amount of trust which is where the due diligence process really comes in. And it is really in the interest of both the nonprofit organization, as well as the corporate donor or say any other philanthropic, any other donor for that matter, to get this due diligence process right. Because once say, the base is established with respect to that right degree of trust, that right degree of transparency, uh, that right degree of say, comfort in that relationship, it just serves us for the rest of the relationship and the engagement that we might have, you know, I think the overall foundation of it is really, in a way, starting from that element of trust. And therefore, the elements I think some of us are talking about, such as being able to kind of utilize these funds, being able to kind of, uh, uh, you know, having the right degree of transparency, this is all helping us towards setting that right foundation towards that relationship that we are initiating. So that's just at the meta level, the way we think of, of the entire due diligence process and the way we encourage some of our customers to also possibly think of really not in the sense of being extremely finicky about a lot of things, but really what exactly should we do to build a reasonable amount of trust about the organization to start with. So if you just, just move on, Ashwini, to the next slider. Now, how do we even think about all of these things? Right? I think we have looked at things like transparency. We have looked at, uh, say, I think the responses around capability to utilize funds, many other such pointers. Now, at a high level, uh, how can we decompose, deconstruct, analyze overall due diligence? Uh, and in our opinion, this is what we believe are some of the areas under which the overall remit of, of uh, due diligence can be subdivided. Uh, these may or may not be exhaustive, but this just helps us to kind of think about the different ways in which an organization can be thought of, can be deconstructed across very specific parameters to be able to come to a reasonable estimate of whether an organization, uh, what kind of uh, you know relationship engagement should we have 
with that organization going forward. Right? How do we build trust across all these different parameters so that what ends up being is we are able to uh, start off a relationship or, or kind of continue a relationship uh, in the right way uh, with the, with the, between a say a donor organization and an, and an NPO or a, an implementation organization for that uh, for that matter. Uh, one important thing also to just keep in mind and we'll kind of go a little deeper into that as part of this session as well that this is not a one time aspect uh, if we think in the in the context of say building trust uh, that's something which needs to be retained it needs to be something which needs to be a cross cutting uh, aspect throughout the process throughout the engagement between say any kind of uh, organization civil society organization uh, and say a uh, kind of an implement or say a philanthropic uh, body right so to that extent we need to possibly look at it as how do we kind of think of it from a foundational lens and therefore how exactly can we maintain that degree of trust uh, throughout the, the process and therefore that element of dd is something which will keep recurring as we will see at the course of this uh, of this discussion and and con what we'll just do is maybe uh, just maybe deconstruct some of these elements just to kind of give a sneak peek, right? In terms of how we think some of the corporate ecosystem is evolving in terms of looking at all these different areas towards arriving at uh, understanding how credible an organization is, how capable uh, an NGO is. And I think one of us mentioned that is the money going to be safe, right? Or is say the resources which I will share, it could be time, it could be money, it could be the time of our employees. Is it going to be safe? Is it actually going to reach the last mile beneficial? So to that extent, when we look at these broad six areas, we always, of course, can understand compliance, right? I mean, it's all the more important from a CSR perspective because corporates are uh, liable. Corporates are also put under a lot of pressure towards meeting compliance requirements. Similarly, FCRA, I'm sure all of us can understand, uh, as also putting a lot of pressure on, on organizations of different types. Right? So compliance becomes an area for organizations to, or donor or philanthropic organizations to deep dive on. Checking for things like FCRA applicability, CSR applicability, uh, all the other uh, associated threads that come along with uh, compliance. So when we talk about financial diligence, I think we'll go a little bit deeper onto this, but at least when you're kickstarting a relationship, when you're trying to assess the fitment of an organization for say a certain uh, say engagement, things like as an organization, can an organization even absorb the kind of funds that we get? Has the organization can they possibly demonstrate the right kind of controls on its financial utilization? What is the kind of financial history that the organization, that the NPO might need? That becomes an area for us to, uh, for corporates or for any philanthropic organization to do a due diligence uh, around. Reputation becomes a little, uh, becomes, these are the areas that we're trying to get slightly, which becomes a little, little bit more subjective uh, in nature. So things to understand with respect to say, how exactly is an organization say being covered in the media? Right? Are there any public allegations against, uh, against the organization? How well reputed are organizations say in the government ecosystem? How well reputed an organization could be amongst say your peers within the civil society organ in the ecosystem? When we talk about the ecosystem engagement, we look at how are you possibly contributing beyond just your projects, maybe towards through things like thought leadership, through things like you know further developing the overall social sector ecosystem. I mean, a lot of us would of course be aware of say initiatives such as RCRC, right? uh, many other such collaborators have come together, right? which help to strengthen the sector as a whole, or which tend to look to kind of create public goods that can help to build overall knowledge uh, in the sector uh, and in the overall social impact ecosystem beyond just the, the project uh, focus that uh, that we tend to have when it comes to implementation. When it comes to say governance, I think one of the things which is happening in a big way, especially with the corporate ecosystem, I'm sure many of us may have heard about how ESG is becoming a lot important for corporates. Right? ESG for those of us who may not have come across, stands for environment, social, and governance, which means that anything and everything which, uh, which say a donor, which for argument's sake, a corporate, for example, undertakes, there should be a very high degree of, of say, governance uh, around it. There should be a very high degree of transparency uh, around it. And that is not just restricted to the way 
the corporate themselves conduct their business, but also across the entire value chain of partners, right? be it their suppliers, be it their vendors. And today, increasingly, even the NGO partners that they are engaging with, they should also adhere to certain norms with respect to governance and transparency. So things like such as to understand whether an organization has a written code of conduct. Uh, does an organization have a written HR policy, for example? Uh, does an organization say place equal importance say, or, or at least a high degree of importance to say things like diversity and inclusion, for example? These are the kind of things which corporates a lot are today are asking for because that is in a way aligned to their overall ESG uh, mandates. And just as CSR regulations had tended to kind of, you know, helped in strengthening the overall ecosystem with respect to compliance and reporting, et cetera, is concerned. This ESG, the development around ESG is really going to impact the social impact ecosystem in terms of how do we strengthen the overall governance and how do we kind of report it back with transparent annual reports, transparent disclosures, uh, annual reports, financial statements, et cetera. Finally, I think the bread and butter that we think of from an uh, organization's point of view is its ability to create impact how well an organization may be able to say, plan for its projects, uh, what kind of systems and processes that an organization might potentially do, uh, what kind of technology capabilities that the organization may have. These are areas which are being asked for. These are areas which a lot of donors are getting interested to know about. And therefore it is our intent that we kind of share this knowledge because that's how a lot of corporate donors, at least in the corporate ecosystem specifically, are trying to assess, uh, you know, the organizations that they tend to, you know, partner with. What all of this, in a way, uh, essentially means is, is that while these are big blocks in themselves, and there could be more such elements, I think this is more to serve as an indicative uh, example. I think the very specific things like uh, geographical alignment, beneficiary alignment, I think those things are, of course, uh, add-ons uh, for sure as part of the due diligence process. But uh, each of these big building blocks, the way, I mean, we can think of it in the form of indicators. Uh, indicators are part and parcel of a lot of the things that we do as part of the of the social impact ecosystem. When it comes to say, kind of demonstrating that we have created impact, we have to kind of demonstrate it as against certain specific indicators. Even as part of due diligence itself, it's not too different. So each of these gets further decomposed, deconstructed into specific indicators, which can again vary from corporate to corporate, but at least at the high level overview, I think what we wanted to share, at least for starters, is that uh, that a lot of donors, uh, especially in the corporate ecosystem, are trying to build a 360 degree perspective about the organizations, the NGOs, the NPOs that they are looking to work with. And these all areas become critical for NGOs to uh, kind of report on, to kind of talk about, to kind of demonstrate their competence around, to be able to put their best foot forward when it comes to getting those, uh, getting through some of the fundraising, funding opportunities that the ecosystem, in a way, looks to uh, provide for. So that's broadly, I mean, at a meta level, it's really the idea is to Think of it from a 360 degree perspective of getting a full picture or, a, or a, as close to a full picture of an organization uh, prior to, say, an engagement so that we exactly know what kind of relationship or what kind of capabilities that the organization has so that we can start that relationship on a sense of trust. I think that's, I think the big picture view that we in a way wanted to share by way of giving this overall uh, view. And to make that happen, of course, there are some of the tools which are available for uh, donors. I think they, of course, tend to seek a lot of information, which in many instances, let's be honest, comes across a little bureaucratic or say paperwork intensive, but really the objective in most cases is to be able to understand, assess, uh, get a full picture of the organization and therefore have the right degree of trust. Right? So starting Hello, off with say prime. Yes. Sorry, uh, any of us speaking? Hello. Yes, Mino, you're audible. Yeah, I'll maybe just quickly go ahead, uh, complete this point, and uh, so essentially, some of the tools which are available for the 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 donors, they of course seek information 
uh, from from all of us from an NGO standpoint to build an initial understanding, but they also conduct their own independent secondary research. Uh, they conduct interviews, of course, with the leadership of the NGOs to get that perspective, get queries resolved. And also at the back end, many of their corporates do they conduct reference checks and talk to say other donors who might have engaged with uh, with the NGO in the past. So that just helps them. These are the tools that help them towards coming up with this 360 degree view aided by certain ind certain indicators, which of course tend to vary from instance to instance, but that is the picture that a corporate tends to uh, try and build uh, from an overall organization uh, trend, uh, standpoint. So we can move to the next slide. So what we'll just do uh, as part of today's conversation is to really go slightly in deep on, especially on the financial aspect of it all, because that's where in our experience, we tend to get a lot of doubts, questions, where there's a lot of declutter as well. So we'll have Bart speak a little bit from his experience and happy to take any questions on any of these as well. Over to you, Bart. Thank you, Akshay. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, you've covered a whole lot of point uh, with respect to, you know, with respect to the due diligence of an organization at an organization level. Uh, coming to the uh, part of financial due diligence, I think uh, all the organization, uh, you know, uh, uh, are getting their books of accounts audited through their own statutory and internal auditors. Over and above that, there is something uh, which has, you know, recently in last five, 10 years, we've seen that donor side audit has become uh, uh, important and uh, it is critical to report uh, for donors also the correct numbers to their stakeholders uh, in their annual reports and uh, to know, to uh, tell their shareholders about the projects they are doing, undertaking. So we'll slightly go in depth today with respect to the financial due diligence aspect of the uh, organizational due diligence. So if we can move to the next slide. So this is a broad uh, financial due diligence reporting framework, uh, which primarily uh, gives us a picture how through an auditors or a you know due diligence third party auditor lens, how we come and you know uh, inspect the organization, what are the things we look into uh, and broadly First, one, the important part of it is the organize, organization review. So how well the organization is faring, uh, what are the uh, internal controls that organization has set up, uh, what are the policy level documents that are available with the organization. Typically, some policies which are accounting policy, travel, procurement, human resource, these are a very important uh, documentation to even begin the uh, due diligence process with. This uh, broadly gives an idea to the donor as well as their, um, uh, you know, the uh, auditor to ascertain what level of uh, checks and controls have been put in by the organization. And these sometimes become the basis even for uh, the vouching and the other uh, audit exercises that a particular financial audit process, you know, uh, includes. So. Second is a very specific project review. So an organization typically has multiple donors. So when it comes to a specific donor, what exactly do they review uh, pertaining to their project? So when it comes to project, overall understanding of the project, the overall income and expenditure statement of the project, uh, typically the uh, uh, nonprofit organization gives a utilization certificate, what we call at the end of the quarter or, or at the end of the year to the donor. So that is a primary document that is required. Apart from that, monthly or a quarterly MIS, uh, you know, typically highlighting the actual spend and the budgets and uh, uh, giving a broader picture how the project has fared over the period of time. So combining organization review and project review, the auditor is able to come to the point, what is the financial summary of the project, how to summarize the entire expenditure that has been done for the project, and give a picture of the fund utilization, as in if there are uh, further funds required for certain activities which needs to be increased, then that utilization level can be, that decision can be taken after the uh, summary is derived that. So this is the entire framework for the uh, reporting uh, of a financial due diligence. If we can go to the next slide. 
so typically uh, i've classified the donor organized a uh, donor grant due diligence into three aspects wherein uh, a donor would require a third party audit before they fund a organization uh, to ascertain whether what is the credibility of the organization like aksha covered in the points uh, to check or uh, whether there is uh, you know adequate governance adequate transparency maintained at the organization level so this is a pre grant due diligence what we call uh, which includes uh, you know the past project that has been implemented by the organization uh, generally as an auditor we ask what are the uh, you know fund flow statements of the uh, donor uh, donor specific projects the annual reports of the organization for previous years that gives a lot of information to the Uh, auditor to uh, you know back whether the organization has a, a proper credibility to conclude a project or not then as we discuss the policies and the financial frame of uh, framework of the entire organization that is a crucial point to understand whether the organization will fit in the entire uh, you know grant mechanism of the uh, donor uh, of course some com- high level compliance checks with respect to the uh, statutory laws like income tax uh, with respect to the uh, labor laws which are uh, applicable to the organization so all these checks will give a good recommendation to the uh, donor the whether the organization is fundable or not so uh, this is what typically we call a pre grant due diligence secondly we uh, uh, you know recurring due, dal- due diligence which is generally undertaken on a monthly or a quarterly level so this is something which is done after the uh, partner is onboarded the project is sanctioned and the funds are uh, uh, given to the uh, organization to start the project so there is a recurring process wherein the on a quarterly level or a monthly level the activities are measured in terms of the expenditure incurred so a typical budget versus actual comparison of what was planned and what has actually been incurred can be a good standpoint of understanding how the organization is going ahead with the project uh, a typical in de- in depth check of the project activities uh, like what is committed to the project and what exactly is happening in those activity that is something that can be uh, reported as a part of this recurring process uh, again some of the donors we've seen that uh, they generally practice they do not entirely give away the grant amount in one tranche they generally have multiple tranches based on the milestones that the project has to achieve they generally fund that so a recommendation from uh, for the donor on the health of the project is a very important aspect of that and of course recurring check on the compliances uh, which are uh, to be done for the uh, prevailing laws to the organization whether the tds compliances are being done if the organization has taken a separate gst registration for some activity whether that is being compliant or not uh, uh, provident fund labor laws all those uh, high level checks to be done on a regular basis third is the pro- post grant due diligence uh, which uh, generally is taken you know after the entire completion of the project which are typically of 2 to 3 years size the donor would like to assess the impact and would also like to get a financial due diligence done whether the funds have been utilized properly uh, whether the uh, funds uh, have gone to the end beneficiary how the organization has uh, you know transacted whether there are more cash transactions or all the payments are done through bank accounts now it's mandated by most of the statutes in india to do uh, bank transfers but uh, this is a, a checkpoint where at least you get to understand you know how uh, how the project has fared and whether the uh, accountability that needs to be put in the at an organization level has been done or not uh, at a post grant level generally as a third party auditor would do some sample checks of the vouchers and expenses incurred because it's not a recurring process so there won't be so much of in depth analysis but uh, probably a broader 60 to 70% of the entire sample will be looked into and uh, holistically all these points will give a review to the donor whether the uh, future relationship with the particular organization needs to be uh, taken uh, you know for another a new project or a existing project that will be answered through a, a post grant due diligence so these are the three types of due diligence that the organization as a uh, beneficiary may face uh, from the donor end if we can go to the next slide yeah uh today i think uh, 
we'll uh, typically focus on the uh, donor side of aspect rather than the organization because at the organization level we do have internal auditors and statutory auditors who are taking care of the entire balance sheets and pnls and the numbers but when it comes to donor what exactly do they look into so uh, it's not only the income expenditure reporting of utilization certificates uh, like we have already seen how well the organization is prepared to conclude a project so basis that the one of the important point is preparedness for a donor due diligence uh, if the organization has a separate financial team there uh, it is always advisable to keep uh, you know one or two resources separately for any all the donor due diligence uh, during the year so uh, a good uh, you know a good ex exercise that can be implemented by all the organization would be to set up pre audit calls so typically the pre audit calls would be very important for the organization to understand what what are the auditor expectations in terms of their uh, be it the documentation ask be it the uh, amount sample of vouchers they are going to cover so half of the i think job would be completed if a proper pre audit call is set up with the auditor and uh, you know it's a two way process if what are the process of the organization uh, uh, can be communicated to the auditor as well and if you, if the organization can provide the policy and high level documents during the pre audit call which are required by generally by the auditors then uh, that would be a uh, fruitful conversation uh, again uh, while preparing uh, if some guidance to the finance and program team who are conducting the entire activities of the program if can be given that will be uh, really helpful because generally uh, you know there is some kind of gaps uh, between a finance and program team carrying out their individual activities are generally uh, seen during the audit phase so if a corroboration of the finance and program team can be done if proper guidance can be given to the program team as to whatever support is to be given to the finance team during an audit or a due diligence exercise then that is very fruitful uh, second would be uh, you know preparing a checklist of due diligence so if the team is ready with the entire checklist of documents that would be required by a third party uh, due diligence auditor uh, that would be really be helpful for the organization in order to save time on the entire audit exercises uh, organization policies and project policies should be upfront given to the auditors in order to uh, ascertain which materialistic area of expenditures they can focus on uh any high value transactions that are done by the organization for the project should be reported separately because these are the key things which generally in a financial due diligence will be looked into uh, also mapping of the activities with the key milestones of the project that is one important point uh, to understand uh, uh, as to what percentage of the uh, what percentage of the project has been completed uh, with respect to whatever was whatever commitment has been given to the donor uh, generally there is a, uh, do, a donor agreement that an organization signs before onboarding so if those milestones are you know present in the donor agreement then that would be uh, really uh, uh, helpful for the auditor as well as the organization to ascertain where exactly the project stands as on the date uh, another important aspect would be uh, handling queries and observations after the entire audit process has been taken the due diligence has been done by the auditor uh, what are the observations of the auditor uh, the organization should go ahead and ask for donor fee, uh, uh, auditor feedback as to what do they think of the processes which are in place are there any improvements are there any best practices that are missing at the organization level which they would recommend as a part of their report so all these things uh, it should be a very uh, two way uh, communication where even uh, organization should be you know uh, should not be reluctant to ask these questions to the auditor if it is for the betterment of the organization uh, with respect to audit conclusion uh, it is ad always advisable to not keep any uh, you know loose thread uh, open because all the audit discussion and observations that are reported uh, to the donor uh, it it is always responsibility to close on all the threads which will give a positive impact to the auditor and the donor uh, with respect to the uh, processes that are followed by the organization that is something very critical as an auditor i feel that it should be there uh, follow up and key action post audit so 
again uh, once the audit report is submitted whatever uh, key points and recommendation which the auditor has given uh, the implementation of those points need to be taken care by the organization somebody should take the accountability to even uh, you know communicate once the recommendations are implemented to the auditor that whatever queries and observations were there those have been complied and whenever there is a next audit happening you can provide uh, that uh, recommendation implementation uh, document to the auditor so that uh, again those queries will not crop up uh, this also will help in planning the expenses for the uh, you know next audit uh, there may be uh, as i mentioned there may be uh, conditions put in by the donors where uh, uh, post audit certain funds may be recommended by the uh, donor by the auditor and donor may give the funds so it is always better to plan these expenses in advance and communicate it with the auditor that will help uh, in uh, completion of the entire project in time yeah can we move to the next one uh, this is the entire structure of the due diligence report financial due diligence report a typical uh, uh, will be submitted to the donor uh, the first part of it would be the financial summary wherein the status of the funds will be reported to the donor so this is something which i think at an organization level everyone can practice and prepare on a monthly basis also so that effectively uh, even the donor is uh, you know having an idea what is the status of the project and in in next which cycle the funds will be required if there's a deficit coming in uh, second important aspect is the budget versus actual now whatever is committed by the uh, organization during the agreement whether the actual spend levels match with that and what is the variance that is reported there uh, this is a key part of the report that is generally submitted which includes how organization has achieved the milestone which were committed and whether there are any lag in completion of activity what are the reasons for you know uh, overspent or underspending a certain line item so all these things are taken care by this uh, particular aspect of budget versus actuals uh, third key aspect as we discussed is audit audit observations and recommendations generally uh, it's a practice of the uh, auditors to put the recommendations in the report so that it is effectively communicated to the partner organization of what the auditor expectations are and what exactly processes are set in the organization so this is another another critical aspect of the report and lastly the actions taken by the uh, organizations on the last audit recommendations so these are the entire structure of the financial due diligence report that is generally submitted to the donor so you the organization we all can have an idea how uh, we all should in, in which direction we all should work so that uh, a positive report is given to the donor and the correct picture is submitted can we move to the next one okay these are uh, certain evidences that uh, we verify as an auditor so uh, i've uh, divided the entire budget into three cost component uh, the first one is uh, direct second is indirect and third is the administration part so just putting put up some uh, sample evidences that are generally asked by the organization uh, by the auditor uh, when they come for uh, due diligence uh, i think we can share a detailed checklist of the evidences that are verified uh, before that if there are any questions we can take take that up um so part i think there are two questions on the chat i'll uh, maybe take that up and akshay you can also come in uh, here so one is uh, how important is the annual report uh, is a question that has come up um maybe akshay you can you could also come in here based on uh, your understanding uh, of the same and donor engagement yeah yeah i think uh, it's it's becoming all the more important today right i mean as if we what to think about uh, it from the perspective of say companies right companies by statutory requirements are required to come up with an annual report right but there's no such thing for for ngos uh, but having said that it is becoming all the more important for uh, for companies to be able to evaluate look at one document which gives a uh, quite a lot of evidence or a lot of the information which they're looking at 
and the annual report does tend to kind of serve that kind of a purpose, right? And uh, what we can just do is maybe on our chat window as well, we can just put some of the prescribed things that we tend to suggest that annual report should ideally look to cover in an ideal scenario. But at a broad level, a lot of companies, uh, at least from a donor uh, said the due diligence perspective, do tend to ask for it because it serves an important purpose of being that one document, which at least gives a sense of a lot of the information around what kind of other donors you're working with or say, uh, what kind of, you know, uh, are some of the events that you might have organized, what kind of newspaper or what kind of media coverage that you might have had. And the annual report is one place to kind of demonstrate from, from an NGO side of things as well, uh, put our best foot forward in terms of uh, a lot of the information that we would want to share. So whilst it's an important asset that organizations tend to look for, that's CSR specifically, but even for NGOs, I think it's a great tool for us to possibly use towards uh, putting across our work uh, with the larger ecosystem. And what we'll just do is we'll just share some of those prescribed six, seven things that we tend to generally look at, look at uh, from the coverage of an annual report. Uh, thanks, thanks, Akshay. Uh, Parth, anything you would like to add? I think uh, annual report uh, uh, definitely, uh, you know, it's one document that will, uh, you know, go to the donors, uh, to other stakeholders as well. And uh, it will give a broader picture of the how organization has, what, what all projects they've done, uh, what is the uh, project fund size they've been catering, or what is the entire, uh, you know, uh, donations uh, during a year that the organization has received. So it will give an idea to the donor of the capacity of the organization to uh, handle what level of projects can be allocated to an organization. So that is, it's an important document and it's always advisable uh, to put uh, all the relevant information in the annual report. Uh, even, in fact, I've read a lot of annual reports stating the uh, strength of the human resources they, an organization, have uh, in uh, you know under each project so all these detailed things will give an idea of uh, how well the projects can be executed whether whether the don high level donations can be given to a certain organization or not so it's an important document i think more important more uh, information relevant information in the report is always uh, appreciated thanks thanks par thanks akshay um, Partha, I think there are certain questions which are around, uh, I think, uh, uh, the percentage of funds that can be allocated as overheads, right? Um, so there's a question that says what percentage of CSR donation can be used for resource mobilization? Uh, also, can we ask overhead from CSR? Um, so um, any, any, any thoughts on these questions? Part? Yeah, so uh, particularly with question for uh percentage allocation for resource mobilization, I think what you're asking is uh, how much we can spend on the manpower. So when we are, am I correct? Uh, this question has been asked by Jyoti Patil. If if I'm correct with the If you question, want to elaborate the question, if you want to unmute and um, also speak up, that also works. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, yes, that's the question. How much can we invest in the manpower who is executing the project? And, you know, because certain times CSR are very uh, constricted with what percentage that they can uh, allot uh, under the donation that they have given. So I think uh, when you're saying executing, you're, as, uh, you're more talking about the program management team who is taking care of the uh, execution of the pro project. So, which is generally covered in the indirect cost category of a budget you present to the donor. So, uh, there is no uh, specific percentage. Uh, I think, you know, how important the role and the function of the resource is will justify what percentage of donation you can allocate to it. Uh, typically, an uh, indirect cost category has 15 to 20 percent of the entire donation that you receive in a project when I look at it. So this 15 to 20 percent will also have the travel cost for that uh, execution team, will also have the salaries of that uh, execution team and any other, uh, you know, uh, utility expenditure that is required for that uh, execution of the entire project. So if I say 20%, then probably uh, coming to, you know, 10 to 12% of it will be resource mobilization of the entire indirect cost category. That is typically the average that uh, we've seen over the projects. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, another question was with respect to the percentage of uh, overheads for the administrative expense, correct? Yeah, it just says overhead, overhead from CSR, yeah. Yeah, so by overheads, if you are meaning administrative in nature, uh, which are only there to support the entire working of the project, like uh, staff time of the accounts team, of the legal team, of the HR team, or, uh, you know, rental expense, rental expenses which are typically supported through head office of a organization then this is something uh, th there's no specific again percentage given here uh, in any law but uh, the range can vary from anything from 5% to 10% that can be a range where you can look into for the overage yeah uh, i hope that yeah. sorry i uh, I think this question was asked by um, Neha. So Neha, uh, any any further queries or I hope your uh, question is addressed. Yeah. Uh, hi. Yeah, I'm able to unmute it. So uh, thanks for the session. But I wanted to know that, you know, uh, for overhead, do we have to give the segregation where which we have, you know, use that money? Because you understand that, you know, these are the money which we have the, uh, you know, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, freedom that we can spend if any indirect cost or direct cost comes in an emergency situation. Correct. See, I think uh, they have very relevant point, which I've been facing for a lot of uh, audits that I have personally done. Uh, mm -hmm. It is always better to give breakup of anything and everything that is available and that can be shared with a third party auditor or with the donor also. Uh, mm -hmm. There have been times when, uh, you know, you can, you, uh, you can limit your scope, whether you want to uh, provide a certain appointment letters of your management staff or, or or some team members because that these are critical documents which you may not want to share with anyone okay other mm -hmm. than uh, so you can put certain limitations to this but if it is not uh, you know shared then at least an overview of these documents and the expenditure can be given to the uh, donor and it, it is justified that you know we are spending it in this direction these are the bank entries we can show you the bank payments then that is i think more than sufficient you need not uh, always give a breakup of that, but I would strongly advise if it is, uh, you know, if it is doable, you can, you should give uh, a breakup of each and every rupee you spend, be it overheads or a direct cost. Everything. Okay, because, you know, uh, because of that fear. So uh, we got one uh, three crore ka project from some MNC as a CSR. So because of all those fear, we just, uh, you know, uh, scrap the overhead. We were like, you just give us the program expenses. That's it. So that was the kind of anxiety which we have. Should we ask? Should we not ask? No, I think, uh, see, without overheads, you will not be able to sustain the project. At the end of the day, if you have to implement the project, you want to achieve the project outcomes, you need to spend on support cost. Okay. Without the support from the management time, what they are spending, without the support from your accounts or a HR or a legal team or the other support expenses you may require, hmm. you cannot execute the project well. So you have to convince your donor very well that if you are giving me 100 rupees, I am going to spend 4 rupees, 5 rupees, 6 rupees for my support expenditure. Without that, I will not be able to. Okay, unless you have other donors where you are able to meet those expenditure at an annual level and you are ready to compromise on those expenditure for a particular donor, then that is fine. I mean, you have... 10 donors with you, you are uh, taking out all the overage, entire annual overage of the organization from say seven donors and three donors, you don't want to charge any overage. That is completely fine. That is oh, fine. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we can take the next question. Sure. Um, so Parth, I think there are a couple of questions on FCRA. Uh, one question says in FCRA accounting, field staff salaries coming under program or finance. Um, and the, the second question says uh, is from Soumya, she asks, will there be any negative implication if an NGO does not have an FCI? Uh, so I think uh, uh, the first question I'm coming uh, with a field staff salary is coming under program or finance, correct? So uh, I think 
the field staff who's actually executing the project who are core to the uh, you know implementation of the project will be under your program category uh, that's what i think uh, the question is trying to uh, ask that whether it will be a direct cost expense or will it be a administrative or a indirect cost uh, that's what i'm understanding right now so according to me the field staff expenditure would always be a direct cost and be it fcra or non fcra project uh, when you are presenting it as a budget to your donor or when you are accounting it in your books of account you always put it as a direct cost expenditure i hope i understood the question correctly uh i think this the question was from mr bhima rao um sir if you can unmute yourself yeah, sir, and confirm yeah ma'am i am mr bhima rao yeah that is not correct because even including the project coordinators also no project coordinator cost and everything no so we are booking under program only not under admin cost correct and uh, uh, acceptance sir our and uh, so sometimes under this uh, just uh, one thing is coming for example most of our uh, for example we are conducting digital literacy programs and everything purchase of computers and everything no so most of the assets and we are purchasing for the digital literacy program mainly computer training so uh, this all expenses that we are booking under and uh, like a program expenditure only but sometimes my auditor is putting question like assets and it is coming under and uh, admin cost why are booking under program because the That's program okay. is completely digital literacy so the uh, more, like 90% assets and we are purchasing for the digital literacy only so can we book under program or under admin cost sir i think uh, you should al uh, also counter ask your auditor that if the computers or the uh, asset which are procuring for the literacy uh, were not there would you be able to execute the project if the answer definitely the answer is no and how critical purchasing these assets are for your program that is the relevant answer to this they are highly critical if the assets are not there if the laptop computers are not there you will not be able to execute your program so it is definitely a direct cost expenditure it is not a administrative expenditure if your auditor is coming from the viewpoint of reporting for the balance sheet perspective uh, if he is a statutory or an internal auditor you should explain him uh, the difference of how uh, a not for profit organization uh, you know uh, typically works and what relevance of fixed asset is to the project if the laptop or computers or the operating systems were not there you would not be able to impart training for the digital literacy and the program would not function so this is not a computer which is utilized by your uh, uh, you know your accountant or your uh, uh, the other staff at the head of office this is something which is uh, which is going to train the students or the beneficiaries so this is definitely a direct cost Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Sir. Just I will consult with my like the same information I will pass, sir. Thank sir, you, sir. Sir, al always another thing. Uh, any kind of expenditure. This is generally for everyone. Any expenditure which is being questioned, whether to put in the direct cost, indirect cost, or administration. Always think from a perspective how relevant that cost is for the execution of the project. If it is very critical, then that means it is without that you are not going to. Uh, execute the project then definitely it's a direct cost for the project if it is a support cost or a administrative cost then it will fall in indirect and administration so always before booking or uh, while budgeting and pitching to donors just think in that line you will be able to uh, put it in a, a correct uh, component and second sir recently what we did in our organizations no most of our uh, designation we have rechanged it a little bit for example and field project coordinator means a manager that ward we have deleted and we are using field project coordinator or and 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 field program lead so like you not know, to decrease or like and to like you no know, if, if any problem will come from fcra department that's why we redesigned our designation also at the organizational level most of program field that wards we are adding with these things even account accounts officer also no now we are field accountant like that ward we are using we are booking under and uh, and the program pass Sure. So you can uh, use different terminologies, and probably it's all about uh, uh, you know uh, giving convincing the auditors or any uh, person who's uh, reviewing the document that what importance uh, that job is for the uh, con 
you know conduct of the project probably you can use the word project accountant or something like that sir and uh, like what happened recently because we don't have a pf at the organization level so recently one external auditor and one of one of my donor no he audited and everything he suggested because you don't have a like a pf facilities no so you, and uh, you have to detect directly and the professional tax and 10% for all your um, means staff members so if you because most of my staff members they are getting very limited amount mainly field staff no they are getting like 9 to 10 and uh, Twelve thousand rupees. If I will deduct ten, ten percent as a professional charge, no, it is very very difficult. Is there any other alternative if I don't have a uh, PF facilities at the organization level? So maybe the TDS. Probably you can discuss this with your uh, HR team. Uh, this is something uh, uh, you know. You can give rolling appointments to your staff who are uh, you know temporary in nature, and when you don't want to. Uh, all them under the 10% tds bracket okay in order to uh, save that probably what you can do is that uh, they are they may not be covered in the pf law see holistically all the staff members have have to fall under because you are employing them at the end of the day they are not contractual employees or they are not uh, professionals who are providing you services they are employees who are working for you full time okay, they may work for 2 years 3 years that is fine but probably you can uh, Uh, you know make a uh, amendment to the policy uh, bringing in staff on a uh, rolling appointment every one year two year you uh, give them an appointment you treat them as a salaried person but the appointments keep changing so that way is probably you can consult a labor law consultant also on that whether they would uh, you know fall under the pf bracket or not as per uh, for me i think th this strategy can work you can uh, uh, you know uh, give them a rolling appointment and they will not have to bear the 10% tds in in case you want to bring down the 10% tds to 1% 2% you can treat them as a contractual employee or still one uh, no tds needs to be deducted if the salaries are too low to get deducted then probably what solution i can i give you you can discuss it with your hr team yes, sir so thank you so much sir thank you uh, can we take the next one yeah, i think uh, uh, i know just in the interest of time so um i think there was a question around how important is it for the uh, organization to have an fcra and if there is any negative implication if they don't uh, i think uh, fcra registration uh, is definitely uh, you know a positive uh, uh, tick box in the checklist uh, for a, a donor due diligence that we generally do Uh, it is not that fcra registration is there then only the funding will happen but a fcra uh, will give a recognition that the organization is getting substantial funds from foreign companies foreign countries and uh, th there are uh, fcra compliances being done if the registration is taken then the compliances are must so there's another checkpoint uh, which is available for the donor to view whether the organization is doing the compliances in time whether the reporting is done on their websites or uh, and the fcra returns are uploaded in time whatever the data has been uploaded on fcra is correct so there is a compulsion to prepare uh, fcra and non fcra books of account separately so that is a checkpoint whether the books of accounts are separately maintained for fcra donors so it is always going to be a positive note that uh, if you are having a fcra registration good you have done the compliances very good but if you have taken the registration and if you are non compliant then it is a negative impact it's a red flag from the auditor and for the donor so if you don't have a fcra then it is completely fine it's not a compulsion thanks thanks parth um there's a question from sinjini and maybe akshay you can take this so this is around how detailed uh, the proposals to csr should be Uh, so sinjini i think we had done us in before on proposal writing specifically there uh, we had also taken the participants through a, a detailed budget format and how you should, we should probably present budget uh, happy to kind of reshare that session recording with you and uh, the templates that we have but meanwhile akshay if you want to comment on it uh, would request you to do that yeah just one thing to possibly share uh, there is that uh, uh, i mean at a broad level i think the working principle that we work with is when in doubt uh, just uh, err on the side of transparency right uh, so 
at least with CSRs, they do tend to have a preference for uh, for uh, budgets which are at least granular enough to give them uh, at least an activity level or at least a, a kind of a view of the key uh, spaces or the places where the costs are being incurred. But at the same time, what we ought to kind of keep in mind is that at least at the budget level, uh, just having that like plus minus X percent, whatever that number could be, right? That that we do not tie ourselves down to such a granular level such that uh, uh, the the variance is something which becomes very difficult to kind of uh, kind of uh, get through. So when in doubt, let's uh, the the working principle is to kind of be uh, be transparent and therefore to go uh, detailed. Uh, just that uh, just having that pathway in mind, just having that checkpoint in mind that uh, it doesn't have to be to the T, right? It doesn't have to be right to the down, right to the last penny, but at least at a high level, I think. Uh, at a high level, we can say like a 5,000 feet view is something that we should definitely look to uh, kind of do. And that's what a lot of uh, CSRs tend to prefer in terms of being able to get it at the budget stage uh, itself. It also helps in the in the future variance analysis in terms of tracking utilization, uh, et cetera. And hence a fairly detailed version of a, of a budget is generally sought after and, and encouraged at the proposal stage itself. Thanks, Akshay. Um, Part anything you would like to add? Um, Part, are you there? Yeah, I think uh, Meenu, uh, Akshay has answered the question fairly. Yeah. So any other questions if we can answer? Um, yeah, just this one more question that's there, which says uh, when programs are high touch, and hence the salary is heavy. Is there a good way to justify this in a budget to do now? Okay. Uh, uh, if you can explain, uh, programs are high touch in the sense uh, very human resource heavy or how exactly? I think the question is from Marisha. So uh, if you can just unmute yourself and uh, elaborate, that will be useful. Hi, um, can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so basically, whenever like, I, I mean, we've come across a lot of projects that tend to be <clears throat> salary heavy, because they're largely focused on like people engaging with, you know, other people and communities. And it's very high touch in that, you know, it's either related with students. So there's a lot of interaction with students. And so there, there are just more people uh, required in the organization um, becoming and, and it becomes salary heavy. It's just a lot of outreach, engagement, awareness building type of exercises. So, I mean, I, I understand you mentioned that, you know, um, looking at it from the perspective of would the project work if that wasn't there? Um, of course, you know, projects like this don't work without being salary heavy and without having a good employee base. Uh, but other than that, how do you justify it to a donor? Um, you know, because they do shy away from salary heavy projects. Uh, I think, uh, Marisha, this is something, uh, you know, which is, uh, which personally as an auditor, I've also, uh, you know, questioned a lot of times that, uh, but a fairly, you know, answer to this is that uh, uh, what rational, you've taken behind paying such high salaries. Uh, firstly, that, I mean, uh, the human resources are very critical to the project. That is something which is, uh, you know, that needs to be uh, the message, which is very clear. Secondly, uh, the quality of human resources involved, okay, what you are budgeting, um, is, is it comparable to the uh, human resources available in the market? Okay. if. Uh, if you're paying say 10 lakh rupees salary per month, if things, uh, I mean, is it justified enough? I mean, uh, had you gone for a, a, you know, person with a, a lower salary bracket, uh, wouldn't the work get, would, would the work get affected in a way that uh, the outcomes would be the same or not? So these are the things that you can probably have a subjective conversation with a donor. Okay. And definitely I agree that this is something that every donor would shy away uh, looking at the, you know, the uh, per day rate of the consultants or the uh, monthly salary being offered to the employees, which are very pretty heavy sometimes considering the size of the project. So uh, probably you can prepare yourself in advance. 
that this is the rationale we have formed for giving such high salaries and these are the reasons that uh, you know uh, the salary is justified for the project then uh, i don't think the donor would have any objection otherwise okay thank you so much thanks thanks parth um so there is another question on uh, how can we work on service charge how to show that in the books of accounts for example if we charge some basic ser service charge of 100 rupees how can that be showed so uh, by service charge you mean you are uh, putting an invoice to someone and you collecting that funds if um, you can unmute yeah, this sir, if you can just elaborate on the question yes sir uh, so actually uh, we are working in rural areas people are not even uh, uh, you know asking us for uh, you know receipt and all those things though we are uh, you know issuing receipts but uh, we are uh, getting that money in terms of you know cash or something like that so how we okay. can show so, that okay so every donation your your organization is collecting needs to have a receipt uh, because at the end of the day your statutory auditor will come they will check all the receipts uh, that is the, there in their scope of work and if you read a tax audit report very closely they specifically mention what all things they have checked and it is put in the income tax audit report so it is always advisable if you are not maintaining the receipts and documents today please start maintaining not for the audit purpose but for your uh, organization compliance purpose if tomorrow you are pitching a donor for some project and there is a pre grant diligence conducted at your organization if even a 100 rupee uh, donation which has come and there is no receipt against that then you know it's a uh, uh, you know there's a lapse in the process which you should have followed so in my advice whatever donation you are coming be it anonymous or donation also prepare a receipt and um, i think income tax law is very clear you have to your organization has to file a, a form which is called 10 bbd all the names of the donor has to come there so with their pan number so i think this practice you should start even if the donations are coming in cash let me know yes, if there's anything more and uh, yeah one more question uh again uh, like from uh, as you mentioned like from 10 bd uh, so if donors are uh, not filing for uh, income tax exemptions and all those things even in that case we need to form a 10 bd or uh, we need to give details of such donors or it's only for the donors who wants to get tax exemptions now eventually uh, see it is 10 bd responsibility is on the organization so uh, uh, not considering the fact whether someone needs a receipt or not you will have to put everything in the return because ultimately the ret uh, the return uh, has to match with your income statement which is which is signed by your auditor so that is more important so always uh, put all the details in the return uh sir mera uh, like i have one questions recently for purchase of some of the seeds no farmers they have contributed some of the financial amount of money like and 10% as a community contributions so most of the farmers no we issued a money receipts hmm, for the community contribution so is it coming under and 10 bd or what because some uh, recently we uh, like we did some of the farmers their name is not matching with aadhar card as well as in pan card so that a problem we face while filing this and uh, income tax forum yeah you would have taken the uh, pan number for the uh, uh, this farmers right okay. while uh, collecting yeah. the funds from them their community yeah. contribution exil sir last year we have not taken only just we have issued only money received because you know when uh, when we received this information for income tax at that time we faced this problem because most of farmers their name no is not matching when we are and uh, like and uh, putting into the form like even the name not matching so like com community contribution is coming under the donation or what or it is a separate yeah. like income see any any kind of uh, fund which is flowing into your bank account will be treated as a contribution for donation okay so eventually that is to be spent for some purpose if it is coming from a donor or a community or some 
third person whoever is contributing it it is a donation and it is on your income side so eventually it has to be reported that is the agenda yeah but this problem i think uh, most of us we have faced that uh, uh, the name as per pan and, and as per aadhar these sometimes do not match and there are uh, uh, you know differences there so definitely you can contact your auditor and probably you know find a solution like what we have done is that we have put their pan number with the name uh, that is printed on the pan card so that is something you should go by because eventually that pan card is issued by the income tax department and that is how their name is registered in the uh, uh, data of income tax so if you uh, put that name then definitely it will match and uh, i don't think there will be a problem going ahead even if the uh, uh, this case for a particular year is picked up for scrutiny or anything uh nothing uh, you know there is con there is nothing contradictory that you have done eventually the purpose is to report the reporting has been done yes sir only but the, what happened in the rural you know farmers sir they don't have a pan card that and we have seen because we are working very remote and tribal farmers so they don't they have a other cards but they don't have a pan cards uh yeah in that case you can put it as a general donation which is uh, received right you need not report everything in the form Uh, there are donation received from anonymously from people who do not even uh, provide you pan card or other card or anything they just contribute it through your website or through your uh, whichever channel they know so that you can put it in the category of anonymous donation okay sir thank you great um so uh, i think that's the end of the questions that have come on chat um uh, there is a final question which says under 194j technical fees can you list the items covered under that um, sir i think uh, that 194 jb 2% is uh, nowhere related to not for profit organization so let's not even discuss that so the crux i can tell you that 2% is applicable to um, uh, you know infrastructure development companies engineering services company which you are asking 2% it is generally applicable to when royalties and technical services are provided so that section is applicable then so do not please do not get confused while reading that section if generally for a not for profit organization when you are paying fees to your chartered accountant you are paying fees to a consultant you de deduct tds at 10% not at 2% 2% is very specific category in india and very few people are covered under 194j 2% 2% you can go to 194c which is a very general category for contractors you may have hired some mason for getting some work done under your project you deduct tds under 2% and 1% under 194c i hope uh, this clears your doubt sir yeah so but there is just one uh, also a uh, uh, comment from shubhangi on anonymous donations are not permitted and each rupee has to be accounted uh, by the ngo so just want to yeah. get accounting see whatever is flowing in your bank account that definitely will have to come by anonymous donation i meant that there is no pan number or aadhar number linked to that donation so you probably you will have to take a receipt without any name or uh, you know that who has contributed that amount it will have to be a part of your income statement which you are submitting or the utilization yes. i mean the uh, form that you are filing Uh, yeah but uh, there are a lot of queries on any anonymous uh, donations right now uh, so in fact even when we take donations uh, in a drive on a google pay or something we have to have every donor detail with pan card it has become mandatory and it, it is, is questioned by the auditors and it's it comes under scrutiny actually um, so it's <laughs> difficult to do retail fundraising also Uh, if we have to account for every rupee, so I just wanted to point that out because it's uh, become mandatory now. No, definitely. If I am auditor of your organization, I will definitely ask that. But as a uh, you know, for this seminar purpose, I will tell you that uh, if you stop doing that, then probably you are uh, you know stopping the retail donation. So which is not yeah. the agenda. So uh, correct, correct. No, but then you have to get their details. You have to have their uh, pan card, their mobile number. You know, some details are required. Definitely, if details is uh, you can fetch the details. Nothing like it because uh, ultimately it is always good to have details and put it in the receipt and records of the organization. But in in cases where there are online platforms available, there is some website which we have created and somebody. is anonymously donated and they are not sharing the details then 
probably there is no other way of treating that. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's okay. But uh, yes, but also there is, I think, a limit to uh, how people can donate, uh, how much amount they can donate like this without uh, giving details. Uh, they yeah. may not want the ATG. That's different. But uh, I'm just saying because we've come across uh, these queries. That's all. Sure. The second, uh, second one thing we are facing, for example, one donor is contributed, like the donator, for example, and 20 lakhs. Again, again, we received one interest is and uh, one lakh rupees, 21 lakh rupees. So while reporting into the FC returns, no? So uh, against the donor, we have to report and this and uh, 20 lakhs expenditure. Again, the remaining one lakh expenditure, no? So that is, and uh, we have to show under a different income, no? Under a bank, in bank interest income while filing FC returns. So you you mean twenty lakh donation you have received and you have earned one lakh rupee interest income on that? Yeah, yes, and and we spend and twenty one lakh rupees. So while while filing FC annual returns, no. So that and we have to show and twenty one lakh rupees as an expenditures. So hmm. against donor, we are showing twenty lakh rupees as an expenditure. Remaining one lakh we are showing under bank uh, interest bank income. Bank interest income. That is correct. That is correct. Yeah, that is correct. Only just uh, while filing that things. Uh, like sometimes it is a little difficult it is coming for us because so many bank interests are coming some some donors they don't want to create as income but some donors they want to interrupt so that that are like balance sheet and uh, expenditure is not matching with and uh, specific donor things i i get where you're coming from i think as a practice for your organization what you can do is if you are able to bifurcate the interest donor wise it is the best practice you should follow. If certain donor is saying that, okay, we do not want that interest to be allocated to our project, you can take it to the general interest account. That is fine. But it is a, always a healthy practice to bifurcate it. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Um, I think uh, there's a question around, can you please share some templates of vouchers, budgets, or other things? Um, Parth, uh, do you think uh, we can start, uh, share a list of potential documents checklist of a document that they need to everybody yes. needs to have in place from an accounting perspective yes uh, i think uh, i have prepared a, a checklist which generally uh, at my organization we use so i will share that precisely so that uh, what exactly is required you know on a broader level and at a detailed level can be understood through that uh, document and some of the insights have been club, uh, you know, taken in the slide we are looking at, evidence is verified. So all these points are covered in that document. We will definitely share that. Uh, with respect to templates for vouchers, sir, I think uh, vouchers are pre uh, pretty general. I mean, uh, I don't know what you exactly want in terms of voucher from me, because vouchers will be uh, a standard template stating, uh, you know, the date, the name to whom some, if it's a payment voucher, to whom it is paid, the remarks column, amount column. So if you can please clarify what exactly you want in terms of voucher, probably I can share a templates of one or two for them. Sure, sir, thank you. No, I, I, I got it. Uh, I got your point. Uh, these are the things that you mentioned. Those are things in the voucher. But I thought uh, if there is any standard template or something like that. Okay. Thank you. Um. Are there any final questions? If there are no questions, we can uh, wrap up today's session early on. Okay. Great. Um, I believe there are no further questions. So, uh, first of all, let me just thank uh, Parth and Akshay for taking their time out today and anchoring the session. Uh, thank you so much. I hope the participants also found the session useful. Uh, if you have any further questions, please uh, drop your questions on uh, the ID partner network at satwa.co.in. Um, happy to kind of get back to you and we'll address that. We'll also get back to you with some of the indicators and checklists that we spoke about. Um, so uh, really hoping you all found the session useful. Please take out two minutes to fill up a feedback form, which we will circulate with you over email. Uh, that will really help us uh, kind of improve our sessions. Uh, Parth and Akshay, once again, thank you so much. And please um, look out for the further sessions that are coming up on donor due diligence. So we'll be uh, really kind of looking at m and &E part, uh, reporting on program indicators, uh, 
having a uh, panel sessions with donors to understand their expectations on reporting so please um, uh, keep a note of the sessions that are upcoming yeah thank you thank you so much everyone thank, thank you. you so much thank you Good night.